Hi everyone, today I wanted to talk a little bit about the, uh, uh, the different ways that GHC supports generic programming. Um, that there's actually three different mechanisms in GHC today, and they all, uh, they don't quite overlap, they're different, but they all might seem like they overlap. And, and so I wanted to sort of pull them, pull them out. So we have three mechanisms, um, uh, if I could spell. Um, and so we have something called typable, which we'll talk about. We have something called data. Um, you may have seen deriving data every now and then. And then we have something called generic. Um, and, and so these are the three different mechanisms that we're going to review and sort of talk about a little bit about what they do. Um, this isn't going to be so much about details of how to use them, but just sort of understanding the kinds of problems that these different solutions uh, solve. So let's, let's jump in. So I think the simplest of these is typable. So the, the, the best way of getting access to the typable mechanism today is to import type.reflection. Um, uh, you might know data.typable. Uh, uh, data.typable also works, but type.reflection gives you the, the newer API to this feature. So, um, uh, so if you see someone else talk about data.typable, that's fine, but, but we're going to use type.reflection here. So what it does, typable allows runtime type identification. Normally, Haskell erases type, so even though it relies really heavily on its type system and um, allows you to do lots and lots of fun type stuff, it actually erases all of that information before running your program. This is one of the beauties of Haskell, and it makes Haskell run efficiently because it doesn't have to carry that type information around. However, sometimes it's nice to know what type something is um, at runtime. So, so maybe you have a function do something special on ints. Um, and this should do nothing special on every other type, but on int it's going to do something special. So I want to do something like this. Do something special on ints x. Um, x is an int. So then this is going to be x plus 1. Otherwise, it's just going to return x. Um, and so that's kind of silly, but maybe it's something that we want to do. Um, and then there's other things. I'll show you maybe something else in, in, in a minute that you can do, maybe a little bit more practical than this. But this is a nice, easy way to understand what's going on. Um, so you can't write this function as written here in Haskell. That's just not going to work. And again, that's because we erase types. So the function says that it takes any type A, it takes a, a value of any type A, and then returns something of that same type. Well, here it takes x, but because we erase types, we can't ask, is x an int? Is x not an int? We don't know. There's just no way of writing this function that's going to make a runtime decision based on what type we choose when we call this. Uh, so instead, we have to change the type somewhat and say typable A. So what this is saying here is that A is actually known at runtime. That's what typable really means, is that we're not going to erase this type. Uh, the exact mechanism is, is a little bit different than this, but this is a, just a really good mental model for what a typable constraint means. It means an unerased type. So now it does make sense. Now we have the information at runtime to be able to decide, is x an int? Of course, this is not the syntax. The syntax is just hruffle is the result of, let's see, type of x, eek type rep, uh, uh, type rep int. So I'll unpack that all in just a moment. Um, and we have an error because I haven't turned on type applications. So let's turn that on. And oh, it's probably going to complain about GADT pattern matches. Oh, it, it is. Let me show you the error. Uh, pattern match on a GADT requires the, this extension of that extension. So we'll just add GADTs. Um, OK, so now this compiles. Let's just see that it works. So do something special on int. Oh, we need the little funny carrots here. And if I call it on 5, let's evaluate. We get 5. And if you're watching closely, that's not a huge surprise because uh, uh, Haskell GHC will default 5 to have type integer, not int. But I can change that by writing int here. And then I click refresh, and now we get a different result 6. So this is indeed doing something special on int, but not on other types. Um, so very quickly, what's going on here in this syntax, because there's a lot of weird syntax, is eek type rep is an ordinary function. Well, I mean, it's a function. I don't know about ordinary. Um, that takes two type representations. So let's see, what is the type of eek type rep? Um, it is this right here. Um, so it takes two type reps. And then we get type reps by using either type of or type rep. 
So type of has this type. So if we know the type at runtime, given something of that type, it will produce that type rep. So this type rep is really some runtime structure that, that says this is an int. Um, and so what's interesting about type of is it actually ignores this argument here. So instead of passing x, um, I could, well, it would be a little awkward. I could pass undefined here and with a type annotation, but that's gonna take us too far afield. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna demonstrate that. But it actually totally ignores this argument. All it cares about is choosing what the, the choice of type for A is so that it can then produce a type rep that, that, that describes that specific type. Um, the other way that we can see of getting a type rep is to use the type rep function, um, which is just like type of, but it omits the A. Um, and so here, because this result, this type rep A, this could really be any A, there's nothing to fix it. I need to use this at notation to explicitly pass in the type int to say that I want the type rep for int to compare against type of. So that's these two type rep arguments. The result of each type rep is maybe a proof that A equals B. This funny thing here is sort of a, an equality proof. Um, so it returns maybe because maybe they don't equal, um, but if they do equal, we're going to get an equality proof and we can pattern match on that equality proof by using, uh, uh, by, by using a pattern match against H ruffle. Um, can I get, yes, I can actually. If I do this, I think if that parses, yes, we get, wow, lots of information. I don't want all that information. Uh, let's kill off all of this extra stuff down here. Um, and we don't really care about roles right now. I want, I want simplicity. This is a data type that has one constructor and that one constructor asserts that the two types passed in are the same. I'm gonna rewrite this here to be a little bit more idiomatic. Um, and in fact, I can get rid of this extra for all here and then we can really see that href is just a proof that A equals A. So that means that up here, when I pattern match on it, I learn that the type of X is indeed int and then doing this makes sense, that, that type checks over here because now I know x is in. Otherwise, all I can really do is return x. Um, so this is what a a type.reflection does. Um, let's pop over to the documentation real quick. So this module exports all the things that we need. So we have this typable class, this type rep function. Um, with typable allows you to go from a type rep back to a typable in case you have a normal type rep, but you have some function that requires a typable constraint. We can sort of go the other way. It's a little awkward because you can't re just return a constraint from a function. So we have to use this, this um, uh, it's called continuation passing style where you sort of pass the thing in that you wish to continue operating on. Um, then there's the definition for um, homogeneous propositional equality and heterogeneous propositional equality. I don't wanna get too much into details about that more than I've already done. Um, and then the, here's the type rep type, as well as a bunch of other operations that we can do on them, including things like pattern matching. Um, so uh, again, useful if you want to know what type something has at runtime. That's what typeable does for you. The next is data. So this comes from not type.reflection, but import data.data. Um, and what data does is it allows you not only to, to well, uh, typeable is a super class of data, but what data really does is allows you to know the structure of a type at runtime. Um, so let's do a quick example of that. So suppose I have a data type Wurble and Wurble has an int and a bool and an int and a double say. Um, and I'm going to derive show and data um, here. Uh, oh, I'm expecting an error. Oh, I'm getting, why am I getting errors up here? Well, now strange things are happening. What's going on here? Oh, um, that's because uh -huh, data.data also exports some of the old uh, interface to typeable, which now conflicts. So I really only want data from data.data and that's gonna fix some of these problems, hopefully. And I should be getting an error. Yes, I get an error right here. Um, so the error is that, uh, let's see here. The error is that, well, I need to derive data typeable in order to do this, that's fine. I can do that, no problem. Um, it's a little bit confusing, more than a little bit confusing. The name of the extension here is derive, whoops, derive data typeable. Typeable is automatically derived for all types. We don't need to write it. Once upon a time we did, so you might see some old code with that, uh, but it hasn't been true for some years now. Um, to derive data instance, we still do need to say deriving, and the name of the extension is derive data typeable because that's what it was, and 
creating a new extension and deprecating the old one and breaking everyone's code is just not all worth it. So we have a derived data type, but even though it's really just about data. Um, and now that I've done this, what I can do is I can, let's say, write a function add one. Um, so add one uh, takes a, a something of any type A to, to that same type, as long as I know uh, what its representation is. So this data A constraint doesn't just tell me that I know the type, but I actually know the details of the type. Right? The difference is, do I just know that it's Werble? That would be typable. Or do I know that it's Werble, and in fact that Werble has a constructor McW that takes these arguments? Right? That's data. Data tells us about the right-hand side, not just the left-hand side. Um, and so this add one function, I'm going to use, I'm going to write this out, and then I'll explain what it does. Um, oh, and we need to import new things. So we're going to import data.generics to get everywhere. I think actually both of these are exported by data.generics, yeah. Um, okay, and let me show you what it does, and then I will explain. So if I call add one on mcw of two, true, three, eight, um, we will see that the ints are changed. Three and four come out instead of two and three, but the eight is not because that's not an int. That's a double. Um, and so now let's look at, at a little bit more of what's going on here. So we can do that by looking at what is the type of everywhere. So everywhere has this very interesting type here. And the idea is that it takes some generic transformer and I say it's a generic transformer because it takes some type and returns something of that same type. And I say it's generic because it, can, it, it knows the representation here. Um, it takes something and then it returns a generic transformer that works well everywhere. And so that means that what this will actually do is that this will look inside of other types for McWs. Um, so I can do another example up here. I can say add one of McW2 true 3 8 and McW of 10 false 15.42. And because of the everywhere, it will look inside the list and to find the ints buried in the warbles inside the list. Right? Without the everywhere, it wouldn't do that. Um, McT, let's take a look at McT. Um, McT says that um, here, if I describe some uh, transformation on a specific type B, then it will create a transformation that does something interesting on B, but, but then everything that's not B, it just leaves alone. So actually I could have, now that I'm looking at McT here, I could have written my do something special on int in terms of McT. Um, and in fact, in, in some sense, that's what I've done here. This McT of plus one is, actually, I think, completely equivalent to do something special on ints. Um, I would love to sort of have at my fingertips a quick check property to prove that, but I'm not going to get us too distracted by doing that. But I'm pretty sure that they would do exactly the same thing. Um, so using, thing, using combinators like everywhere and McT, we can build up generic transformation. So if we want to take all of the ints and do something, then we can. And it, it doesn't have to just be transformations. It can be queries. We might accumulate the results in a monad, um, all of these things. So this is really nice because it means I don't have to write a custom operation over McW, but I can have all of my data types and then use type information to sort of figure out what kind of transformations I want to do. And that's really useful with the data mechanism. Um, so the data mechanism, as it's exported from data.data, .data, that's where we get this deriving data thing, but many of the operations that we might want to do actually come from a separate library called SYB for scrap your boilerplate. Um, and so this is one module in there. Let me actually go back a step. So data.generics um, uh, re-exports all of these um, other modules here and, and gives you quite a lot of power. And so, um, so this, is, this is a fun thing if we want to go through and write algorithms that work over a variety of data types, but deeply. Um, and so that's what data can do. The last thing that we're going to look at today is um, this, this other mechanism called ghc.generics, which is confusing because it's different than data.generics. So let's import that, import ghc.generics. Um, and that allows us to, um, well, I can still do this on Werble here. Um, oh, no, let me not do that. Let me make a new type. I'll call it record, mcr, and then let's say field is an int and other field is a bool. 
I don't know. Um, and then here I can write deriving generic. Um, and then this is going to complain. Yes, because I need to turn on derived generic, so let's just do that. Um, and now this is good. Now, what generic does is it kind of does the same thing as Ada, but more so. Now, not only do I have some access to the representation of something like record at runtime, I also have access to it at compile time. And so this allows me to write traversals that say, pick out a particular um, element of, of a record, maybe deeply nested, maybe with a lot more complication around it, and actually optimize that at compile time because I might have some function um, uh, well, it's a bit complicated to come up with a full example right here, but I can imagine some kind of call extract field where we pass at compile time the name of the field and then some, some record R. And because we know all of the information about R at compile time, we can optimize this more than we ever could with data where it's all sort of runtime decisions. Um, so uh, let me explain a little bit more about what I mean about this, that it's available at compile time. If we look at the ghc.generics documentation, we see that, let's see, the generic class, there's lots of documentation here. This is very, very good. So, oh, I don't want this. I want, I, uh, um, I want generic. Where's generic? Okay, it's all the way down here for some reason. So the generic class comes with a associated type synonym rep. And this takes something like record and then produces a representation of it. Um, and so we can actually see what that looks like in the example here. Uh, so if I ask for, um, well, to evaluate a type family in GHCI, because these little extra carrots, so these are GHCI commands, of course, um, I have to use, uh, what is it, kind exclamation point. Um, perhaps a better uh, a UI is possible here, but I can call rep of record and evaluate that, and it will actually expand out what this is. And so here at compile time, right, when I say compile time, this is a type family, so we have access to this during type checking. It's very, very powerful. Um, and it tells us that record is a data type, D, that's the D stands for data type, um, with a constructor, the C stands for constructor, and then the S here stands for that there's one selector named field and another selector named other field, and this one is an int and this one is a bool, and then we have all information about strictness and laziness and all of this fun stuff. Um, so with all of this, it's quite bulky, but we can write algorithms that then traverse um, uh, through a generic structure like this. It is, as I said, quite hard to do this, though possible, so you probably want to use a library that already does it. So we have libraries that work with generics. Um, I'm going to highlight two of them. So there's a, a library called Generic Lens and, and then other associated libraries. If you start searching for that, you'll find some there's generic optics and other things in there that allow you to do lens-like operation, but where it's, it's powered not by something like Make Lenses, but it's powered by something like generic. Um, another one that I want to highlight is generics SOP. A little confusing. This one is plural. This one is singular, but there you go. Generics SOP. SOP here stands for sums of products, and it's a particular representation choice within that library. Um, and it also allows you to do these generic operations with, with some ease. Um, so I'm not going to have a full demonstration of all of that in this video, uh, but I, I do encourage you to sort of look at those libraries. They're fairly well documented and, and, and with, with some nice examples there. And it allows you to sort of really use a lot more power from this generic mechanism that GHC gives you. Um, so recapping, right, we have these three different mechanisms, typable, data, and generic. Typable is great when all you need to know is what is the type of this thing? Ah, keeps happening. What is the type of this thing? Um, data is, is great when you want to be able to make decisions at runtime, not only on what is the type of this thing, but how was it defined. And generic is when you want to make decisions at compile time based on how something was defined. Um, so so it, depending on, on how much you want, and different libraries will use these. And so you'll often have to say deriving uh, data or generic. Again, typable comes for free. Anyway, I hope this has been interesting and informative. Thanks very much for watching. Bye.